Welcome to episode number two of the Creating Responsible Companies podcast. We call this episode Shift Happens. Five global trends that made corporate social responsibility mainstream in business and why this information should be a new tool in your management toolbox. In our mission to make CSR easy, we want to provide some context for how CSR became a mainstream business practice. And to do so in this episode, we'll look back at recent history to share a series of events that have taken place and made CSR mainstream in business. But first, let's take a look at what it is called and give it a definition. So some people call it sustainability. Some people call it corporate responsibility. Investors have taken on the term of ESG, which is environment, social, and governance. Some companies call it corporate citizenship, triple bottom line, or people plan at profit. Barbara and I call it CSR, corporate social responsibility, because we have found in our practice that that is what is most widely used and that people can understand. We have not done our industry any favors with all of these terms. It's very confusing for people. But basically what's most important is that a company is responsible in how it operates its business, both socially and environmentally, and how they manage it and report on it. Right, Janet? That's right. And just a quick why. So why are companies embracing this? It's because companies that effectively manage their environmental and social impacts are more profitable than their peers who do not. So what things happened, because this did not happen overnight by any means, to make CSR a mainstream part of doing business today. So let's look back. If you're like us, you've noticed significant changes in the way business gets done, huge differences, even over just the last few decades. I mean, like 20 or 30 years ago, when someone used the word Amazon, we thought of a large river in South America. And if we had to go across town, we would never have thought about getting into a vehicle with a stranger, unless they had like a glowing taxi sign on top. That's right. <laughs> and when we had a question about a random topic, we turned to paper dictionaries because our phones were glued to the wall and certainly didn't respond if we yelled, hey, Alexa, what is CSR? But we can't overlook the fact that we have five generations in our workplace and they all communicate differently and value different things. And that's going to be a really important part of our conversation today. So let's face it, we've experienced more rapid changes in recent decades than the world has seen in lifetimes. And with these changes, people have responded in many ways, like immediately posting food photographs on Instagram. So restaurants talk about having food that comes out to the table that's (laughs) Insta-ready. People post their personal wins. They even post complaints of companies on social media for thousands to see and share. So with these changes come associated risks and opportunities, but a ton of room for companies to innovate which has led to businesses trying to keep up with what is CSR to them? How did this happen? That's right. It's hard to keep up. And and speaking of businesses trying to keep up, let's talk about business leaders. It's very common for business leaders to find the concept of CSR a bit foreign. For many, it's an unknown subject. And really, if we're honest with ourselves, we can likely agree that we are uncomfortable with the unknown. Yes, the unknown can be exciting to thrill seekers or adventurers like me, but even I have a bit of hesitation trying to adopt a concept or practice or even manage something that I'm not familiar with. For example, Janet is exceptional with our company's finances and legal considerations and the logistics for this audio for this podcast. But if I was asked to understand and implement these topics, it would make me uncomfortable. And I think this is where many of today's business leaders have found themselves with the topic of CSR. Where did this come from? How did CSR become something that not only has financial implications for my company and its reputation, but that I had to add it to my management toolbox? Why do my customers care about this and how is this impacting my company's return on investment? And what in the heck do I do with it? If you're a leader, company owner or executive, not to worry. That's why we're here, to make this easy for you. So instead of trying to figure this out on your own, or even worse, ignoring it, consider 
us the newest tool in your toolbox. So for today's episode, we're going to look back a bit to share a series of events and drivers that led us to today. We've identified five key developments that have taken place in the last few decades that have led to what CSR is today, which is mainstream. Of course, there are many more, but we don't want you to feel like you're in history class because I don't think Barbara and I... (laughs) Either one of us did very well in that. (laughs) History. I did not do well in history. Yeah, so we're not going to go down the history rabbit hole, but we will share the Cliff Notes version. And you don't have to worry about taking notes because we've taken care of that in our show notes. So you can easily download the trends. And you should use this list. It's a really excellent resource to have a conversation with others. Um, You just go to destinationbetter.com slash two, and you can download that uh, Uh, information there. If you're a CSR professional, you can use the list as an opportunity to have a conversation with your leaders. So we're going to switch the conversation a little bit there. If you're a leader, give it a look-see so that you're informed. If your investors haven't brought up these topics yet, they probably will soon. And if you're what we call an everyday superhero, someone who wants to lead change inside your organization, it'll give you the street cred to begin conversations about the change that you want to see. And the best part is that this is a two-part series. So in our next episode, episode three, we'll build on this history. We'll talk about what CSR is today and the value it can add to your business. We want you to be more informed so that you can ask for what you want inside your company, regardless of the role you play. So let's dive in yes. to these five trends of how we got to a point that CSR is mainstream. Number one, significant changes in the world. Hang with us here as we throw out some numbers, and we promise that the other side of this, you'll be way more informed, and it's really pretty interesting stuff. So let's look at the world population. April 2019, it was estimated to reach 7.7 billion people. To put this in perspective, it took over 200,000 years of human history for the world's population to reach just 1 billion and only 200 years more to reach 7 billion. And the world population is estimated to be 8.5 billion in 2030, then 9.7 billion in 2050. So let's do some quick math. We see that it took 200,000 years to get to a billion, 200 more years to reach 7 billion, That's a billion every 28 years instead of 200,000 years. And between the 20 year span of 2030 and 2050, we'll add another 1.2 billion. That's a lot of people. And the increase in population will drive an enormous need for more food, more energy, and more water. Did you know that from a baseline year of 2014, By 2030, there will be a 50% increase in demand for energy and food and 30% increase in demand for water. This is called the food energy water nexus. And let me just repeat, by 2030, there will be a 50% increase in demand for energy and food and a 30% increase in demand for water. We've got to figure out a way to get there, right, Janet? We do. On top of this, we've got a growing middle class that has more disposable income, so they want to buy more things. People in developing countries who were once aware of tangible items like technology and luxury cars can now see these items on their computers or mobile devices. This has really raised the bar of wants and desires to keep up with others. And companies are happy (laughs) to sell more products all over the world. On top of this, we've become a disposable economy. People like my grandparents used to buy one item to keep for a lifetime or even keep it for generations and hand it down. In my generation, the boomers, we've become so accustomed to buying many of the same items and tossing them when we want to buy the newest one. Not to mention eating off paper plates with plastic utensils. I mean, they're only used once and they sit in a lifetime And I mean they're only used once and they sit in a landfill for a lifetime. 
My grandmother, who immigrated from Hungary into the U.S. through Ellis Island, would gasp at such waste. These purchases have then led to massive increases in manufacturing for this one-and-done economy, which leads to more ships carrying items to other countries and trucks to take the items from the shores to the stores, and not to mention the delivery trucks to our doors. And because we aren't keeping items like we once did, guess what? We just have more waste, a lot more waste. We have waste from making all these items, think about the water that's used for growing and processing cotton for clothes, the energy that's used to build electronics, and even farmers trying to grow more food to fill more plays. And this for society in the U.S., where food waste is estimated at between 30 to 40 percent of the food supply. That is right. You heard me That's correctly. Disgusting. 30 to 40 percent of the, our food supply is wasted. And in the U.S., because of that waste of 30 to 40 percent of the food supply about 21 percent of the water that's used to grow our food is wasted through the food waste my grandma would shudder at the waste much less it looks like her great grandkids the generations of today are going to have to deal with that all so of our five trends here's number two trend number two how companies offerings have shifted to what was primarily offerings that were tangible, things that you could touch and feel they were manufactured or produced, like steel or even printed materials, to today, now more intangible items. So let's dive into what that is. For example, a few decades ago, most of my family members worked in a factory or some kind of production facility making things. Think about it. Where do most of your family members work now? I suspect that some may work in technology, for example, for software companies or for businesses that support services on the internet. Maybe they create websites or answer calls in a call center, which are now even driven by artificial intelligence. That's right. And this shift into technology, the gig economy, the shared economy. So you think about like Lyft and Uber and Airbnb has part been part, sorry, This shift into technology, the gig economy, and the shared economy, so think Lyft, Uber, Airbnb, has been part of an evolution of businesses, where once most companies' balance sheets reflected the value of factory equipment, inventory, and product on hand, now many companies' balance sheets account for a few computers, some online services, and a few employees. An entire company can just be built in someone's bedroom with a laptop now. It is amazing. Even look at Uber and Lyft and Airbnb. They are some of the largest transportation and hospitality companies, and they don't even own the cars or the properties. Their company value is based on intangible assets, like reputation and customer experience, and the ability to attract and retain the best talent in their companies to keep the company's offerings innovative. Even the overall culture of the company is intangible. So I hope our listeners know that I love data. Data, her favorite four-letter word. It is my favorite four-letter word, and this is one of my favorite data points. Several sources have estimated today that over 80% of the market value of the S&P 500, and if you don't know what that is, just Google it, market value, S&P 500 is based on intangible assets. Talk about a shift. So in the 1970s, it was less than 20%. And now it's 80%. And now it's 80%. It's It's amazing. And that is another one of those things that's driving some more of these shifts. And we're going to talk about some more of those in number five. So you guys are going to have to hang (gasps) on. You're such a tease. I am. (laughs) All right. So we're going to move on to number three. We'll look at how the internet has made it possible for anyone to look up anything about a company and why a company is expected to be transparent in the first place. Like no other time in history, information is available 24-7, 365. Communications are pushed and pulled, meaning that companies push communications to their website, in print and on social media. 
At any given time, within minutes, a company's reputation can be significantly harmed by accurate and even inaccurate information. A story can go viral at a moment's notice on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any social channel. And Barbara, you and I talk about some of these stories every single day. That's right. We could, I think we'll do a whole episode on that. We can. So for these reasons and many more, companies are expected to provide the information that we as consumers or citizens want when we want it, except some, well, let me see. That's right. For these reasons and many more, companies are expected to provide the information that we as consumers or citizens want when we want it, accessible in a place that we can easily find it at any time. In fact, if we don't find the information we seek, we often, in fact, typically think the company is hiding something. So think about that. This is why it's imperative for a company's reputation to be transparent. So what does this mean? Companies are expected to publicly share details about their social and environmental impacts, such as how they operate their business, how they treat their employees, how they give back to their communities, what they do with their waste, etc. In a moment, we'll talk about the formal reporting frameworks that companies share information and why these systems of data sharing have become table stakes or the minimums for how companies communicate. Number four, let's talk about this social phenomenon. We now have five generations in the workplace together. Generational difference affect your employees and your culture and your bottom line. And the younger generations, the millennials and Gen Zs are seriously raising the bar on expectations for transparency and action. So let's look at them. We'll walk through the five different generations and explain what's important to them and how you and your business can use this information to help manage them and also address customers or consumers that you you have as uh, recipients of your products or services. So let's start with the oldest ones, Janet, the traditionalists. At the time of this recording, they are now age 74 and older. Think of your grandparents and great-grandparents, or maybe even great-great-grandparents. They served during many wars. They're patriotic and developed a culture of giving back through hard times. Men were at war, women were at home, many working in factories, growing victory gardens, and helping each other out. When the men came back, many of them went to work in factories. They banded together to help each other out during the tough years. So the next generation which is where Barbara and I fall in, That's right. is the baby boomers. So now ages 55 to 73, uh, raised in the 60s, educated in the 70s, and we were in college in the early 80s. So this is all pre-computer, uh, influenced by a culture of activism and equal rights. And I might add that we're at the lower end of the baby boomers. <laughs> we are, and I might add also just two quick points, since I just gave my age away. Um, that number one, our baby boomers are a lot of the executives that we have um, sitting on boards now and in executive leadership positions. And when we were in business school in the 80s, all pre-computer, um, this is when tangible assets were still the majority of the assets in those companies. So when we were in business school, it was profit, 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 and that's mm -hmm. completely changed. And I think that we need to look at that. And I also think that uh, the interesting thing about boomers is that we're in kind of um, a position that's um, sort of in between where we see lots of different generations all at one time. And I think that the boomers have more of a wider perspective of all the generations in the workplace and they can probably connect with more of them than the other generations can so just my two cents in there thank you for that two you're cents, welcome Janet. the next younger generation is gen x they're now ages 39 to 54. think about it this is when activism shifted to volunteerism entrepreneurialism became a thing and this generation first started recognizing diversity millennials who are now between the ages of 22 and 38 raise the bar on their expectations of companies 
They have super high morals. They're very socially minded and they want to work at a job that they love and they will even take a pay cut to do so. If you look at the population statistics too and the workplace, another data, Janet, <laughs> side note, there aren't enough Gen Xers to fill the spots of the retiring boomers. So that means that if you're doing some succession planning, you may be looking at needing, you may be looking, I'm gonna start that over Julius. Millennials who are now ages 22 and 38 really raise the bar on their expectations of companies. They have super high morals, they're very socially minded, and they wanna work at a job they love and they will even take a pay cut to do so. And another Janet data point, if you look at population statistics and the workplace, there aren't enough Gen Xers to fill the spots of the retiring boomers. So if you're succession planning leaders, you may be looking at needing those values-minded millennials a little bit faster than you originally thought. That's right. Hold on for these big changes. And the youngest generation in the workplace now is Gen Zs. They are 21 years old or younger. They're super entrepreneurial. They're multitaskers who have super high expectations of their employers. And it's not just diversity anymore that they care about. It's diversity and inclusion. Inclusion is those behaviors and social norms that make people feel welcome. This is really important to them. They're minimalists and their heroes, guess who their heroes are? Their parents. They have super high expectations of companies to be environmentally and socially responsible. And ironically, they want to be mentored in the workplace by someone older than they are. And they need to feel good about the company that they're working for. So what can you and your business do to make them feel welcome. Number five, the last part of the CSR puzzle. Companies are now starting to tell their stories and some of them show that they're being socially and environmentally responsible. If you've ever read a CSR or corporate social responsibility or sustainability report, this is different than a company's just regular annual report. You'll understand the need for this information to be organized, just like the company's annual report. This has led to the development of some organizations to help consumers, employees, and even investors understand the information, the environmental and social information that companies are reporting, how the company is managing its social and environmental impacts, and how managing them is affecting the company itself. While we could literally, and we probably will, probably will, do an entire podcast on each of the organizations that we would like to talk to you about, we're just going to take a look at a few today, and there are a few that uh, you probably have already heard of. So we've selected four different frameworks and organizations to walk you through so that you can see how sophisticated it has become with companies reporting on social and environmental data and what the expectations are. So we'll start first with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They're also called the UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And there's 17 goals that were created when a group of countries came together to address the really big global challenges that we all face, such as poverty, inequality, climate, environmental degradation, prosperity, and peace and justice. Many companies are now taking actions to help meet these goals, and they're doing it through their CSR programs. Next is the Global Reporting Initiative, or loosely called the GRI. And this is a way for companies to organize how they report their social and environmental impacts. They've got information categories that have been given a code number so readers can compare and quickly find the information they're interested in. So if they go from one company's report to another, they can look at this coding system and look for the exact information that they wanna see, whether it's like in labor practices or supply chain information or waste or profitability. So it's great, it's really become great so that you can compare apples to apples. 
Absolutely. And that's one of the biggest problems is that everyone's reporting stuff and information. And it's hard to do apples to apples. So there are a couple of things um, that have developed as a result of that. One of them is the Dow Jones Sustainability Index or the DJSI. So as sustainability has become more commonplace, people want to personally invest in companies that are socially and environmentally responsible, not only because they outperform those who are not, but especially for millennials and Gen Zs, they want to know that their investments are making a positive impact. So the Dow Jones Sustainability Index is just one example of a way for people to invest in companies with sustainable business practices. And it also is another way for investors to compare company to company that information. So when companies are invited to respond to the Dow Jones Sustainability Index questionnaire to see if they can actually make it onto the index, the investors who are reviewing then can take a look at that and, and compare apples to apples. Last but not least, one of my favorite 100% favorite subjects is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. It's also called SASB. They have developed standards across over 80 industries that help investors and companies compare social and environmental performance across like companies. So remember when we talked about the intangible assets earlier, reputation and culture, how a company handles social and environmental impacts, those intangible assets aren't usually reflected on companies' balance sheets or income statements, their financial statements. So SASB is working with investors and companies to identify information about those intangibles that investors can then use to make investment decisions. So what we'd like to emphasize here is that there's a lot of information out there. It's being put into a number of different frameworks and in large part because people are investing in these companies. They're actually voting with their dollars about what companies they want to support. So this is super important. And that was a lot of information. <laughs> and we know that. But our job here is to equip, empower, and encourage you and to make this topic of CSR easy and at least understandable. And we want you to do something with this new tool in your management toolbox. So take a look around your own company. Who is in your workplace? Who are you trying to hire? And if you were to share your company's responsibility actions, might it benefit your hiring? Can you see how these trends are affecting them and how they might be affecting what you purchase and even where you work? And look personally at what products you buy. Do any of the topics we mentioned today impact your buying habits? We would love to hear your story mm -hmm. and how these topics are affecting your workplace. So you can go to our multi-generational right. <laughs> friendly <that>? website, <laughs> destinationbetter.com, and just click on the tab that says say hello. There you can send us an email or you can even just click on the little button and leave us a voicemail. I think you can live up, leave up to a two to three minute That's voicemail. That's right. We'd love to hear your lovely voice. Yeah. And with your permission, we'd love to share your input in future episodes. So if you have a great story and a way that you are um, taking a look at some of these uh, five trends that we just talked about in your business and you have some great solution that you want to share drop us a voicemail, let us know that it's okay to share and uh, we're happy to put it on the air. So today we looked back at CSR trends and how they have become more mainstream in business. And in our next episode, we're going to take a deep dive into my favorite subject, data <laughs> and statistics so that you can be armed with this information if you want to have some of these conversations in your workplace. There are tons and tons and tons of reports. You don't need to go out and read them. Barbara and I read them every single day. And so we have pulled together some of the um, statistics and data and reports, the latest and greatest information, so that you can take a look at that. And um, there's no question about it that 
companies that are environmentally and socially responsible are more profitable. People want to go and work there. They want to feel good about it. And we're going to give you a little bit more data behind that in our next episode. So you're going to be completely empowered. That's right. That's the second part of this two-part series, looking back and then looking at today. And so it'll be a great information for you to have. And that will be episode number three. So we would love to have you find us at destinationbetter.com. You can look at episodes. You can take a look at our Say Hello tab and drop us a note or the voicemail that we just talked about. You can follow our company on Facebook, or we would love to have you inside our growing CSR Facebook community and our Facebook group. We're on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We really think that you'll find some like-minded peeps to help you create your responsible company.